It is Easter, amen? We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the cornerstone and the core of our faith, amen? Hope is the anticipation of good, good that's going to come our way. We gave our lives to Jesus. Our lives are filled with hope. We have not only hope for the past, God to heal past hurts and past memories. We have hope for the future, that God is with us today, whatever we face. Hope for the future and hope for eternity, amen? It all started on a cross on a Friday, and on Sunday, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Let me give you Matthew, or excuse me, Matthew's version of this. We're in Matthew chapter 28, I think, in just a second. And I'm going to start in verse 1. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn there. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began, that would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him, became like dead men slain in the spirit. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. Amen. Most of us in this room probably have had the born-again experience. We had our different routes to come to Jesus, maybe some conviction of sin, some you were loved into a relationship, maybe through some different teachers or family members. Some of us, uh, on our own, somehow Jesus just came in. And there was a moment in time that many of us can point to and say, that's the time I gave my life to Jesus. Many others might have had a church experience where they grew up in church, like, thank God, these kids, and they can't really point to a time, but somewhere along the line, they surrendered their life to Christ. We've seen the blessings of God come in our lives since we've been Christians. Do you realize that that came about because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's why it's the core of what we believe. Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. Verse 20, though, he goes on to say, but Christ indeed is risen from the dead, the first fruits of all those who have died. Christ is risen from the dead. I want to take this morning and look at that last week of Christ's life, the time when Christ, what we call Passion Week or Holy Week, we knew that last Sunday we celebrated, does anybody remember what last Sunday was? Okay, all right, we threw these palms, we were waving these palms, and we tried to worship the Lord last Sunday as a congregation. And Christ came into the city, that was the giving of the Father to his people, a king. If you're a born-again Christian here today, you belong to a kingdom, and you have a king what is the king's name? Jesus. Amen. Jesus is our king. We can't see him physically now, but someday we will. Someday we will see our king in heaven when we get there. Jesus went out of the city that night after looking around the town, around the, the actually not a town, a big city. Uh, on Monday morning, he comes back towards the city with his disciples, and there's this tree standing over there. It's a, a fig tree. Figs, food, hungry disciples. They go over to the fig tree to get some figs, and there's no figs. And Jesus does a strange thing. He curses the fig tree. Cursed are you, fig tree. Some people think that's an analogy to the Jewish elders that were supposed to be bearing fruit in God's kingdom, but instead they were spiritually dead. Do you get that? Religious people spiritually dead. They weren't bearing any fruit. Are you bearing fruit for the kingdom of God as a Christian? They go into the city and Jesus finds some shysters. Anybody here ever had any connection with any shysters running around? 
Uh, these guys were, they were buying and selling in the temple. They were supposed to. They were supposed to be there. They were supposed to give the worshipers coming into the temple, they would sell them animals, ox or a sheep or whatever the animal, appropriate animal was. But instead of charging them what they should have charged them, they increased the price. It's like, it's like they went in and to buy a $100 cow to be sacrificed, and they charged them $500 for it. Jesus came and saw that, and he got upset. Not only were they ripping the people off in the temple, but they had this set up in the court of the Gentiles. Now, if you were a Jew, you could go into the inner court. But if you were not a Jew, like myself, I could have worshipped back then the true and living God, but I had to stay out in the court of the Gentiles. But these guys stuck all these animals right in the court of the Gentiles. There wasn't hardly room for Gentiles to worship. See, Jews didn't really think too much of Gentiles. Now, what if it was here today, and what if you had a cow on one side of you and a sheep on the other trying to worship here this morning? Bah, moo, bah, moo. I mean, it might stink a little bit. I mean, that's what it was like. How can you worship God with all this noise and these animals and this smell? And Jesus saw that and was upset. Worse than that, these guys would come, the worshipers, wanting to worship God, they would come into the temple, they would pay their 500 bucks for a 100 duck cow, they would lead the cow over to the other priest to kill, they'd turn around and walk out of the temple. Where's the worship in that? They were going through a ritual, but there was no worship. It is so easy for Christians today, myself included, to get caught up in churchy, the churchy world, and we go through the ritual, but where's the meaning? In fact, where's the connection to God for so many of us? And yet, that's the very purpose we're here, is to connect with Him, is it not? I mean, it's nice to be um, in here on Easter Sunday morning. You guys look so nice, dressed up so well. But it's really not about that. It's about your connection to God and your worship of God to come into church. Jesus looks around and he, he grabs some cords and he overturns the tables and he runs those guys out of there. My house is to be called a house of prayer, it's written, and you've made it a den of thieves. And he runs those guys out and they're pretty upset, you can imagine that. Um, he cleansed the temple. Matthew tells us he also healed the sick. He healed the blind and the lame that day in the temple. That would be Monday of Holy Week. And then as he was leaving, he, he began to weep over Jerusalem, as he could look at the city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known the time of your visitation. That night they went out. We don't know where he spent the night, but a good bet would be maybe Lazarus over in Bethany. It's only a few miles away. Possibly that's where he's at. On Tuesday morning, here they come back in towards the holy city, Jesus and all the disciples behind him. They come up to that fig tree, and that thing's not only dead, I mean, it is literally withered, like it had been dead for... 20 years or something. I mean, just, it's, it's amazing how that kid withered that much. And they look at it and say, Master, look there, that fig tree. Look how it's withered. And Jesus takes that time to give a faith lesson. He gives the disciples something that you disciples and myself need to realize. He takes that moment and he said, I want to tell you about the power of faith. He said, I curse this tree and it, it will tell you can do the same thing by faith. In fact, he says, you can tell a mountain to be removed and cast into the sea if you have faith and do not doubt. Faith in Christ releases the power of God. You have literally at your prayers have the power of God laying resonant there waiting for you to bring the power of God into the world by prayer and belief and not doubting. Isn't that amazing? They go into the city, and he starts arguing with these religious people again. Judas, meanwhile, sneaks off away from the group, and he goes and talks to the Sanhedrin, and he cuts a deal to lead them to Christ when he's not around the crowds. They're afraid of the crowds. They might get stoned. And so, Judas, tell us where he's at at night. We can capture him. And so Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, cuts the deal on Tuesday. They leave the temple, and they're, they're leaving. And as they get across the Kidron Valley and up on the next hill, the Mount of Olives, they turn around, and Jesus gives us what's known as the Olivet Discourse. He begins to talk about 
Well, first he had told them final things, and then he told them about the power and what he would need them to do. And now he's talking about end times. What it's going to be like before Christ comes back. What the world, what condition it's going to be in. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. They're going to persecute you for my name's sake. In fact, he said it's going to get so bad that the world has never seen it this bad. If God didn't stop it, every human would be killed. We call that many times the tribulation period. Do you guys know that we start a new Sunday school class, the Mainers? Where are you guys? Raise your hand, would you? Where are they at? Somewhere around here. There they are over there. They start a new Sunday school class. It'll be next Sunday at 9 o'clock. And they're talking about current events. And how do you plug this into the end time scriptures? Hmm, pretty interesting. Come out next Sunday if you want to, 9 o'clock. So they, he gave the all the discourse, they took off again and uh, stayed somewhere that night. Wednesday of Holy Week, we don't know what Jesus did. The Bible doesn't say. My guess is if I knew what was going to happen Thursday and Friday, I would have been spending the day in prayer. So that's where I would put him, probably in prayer, preparing himself for this. Thursday morning, here they come back, they come into the city, they are going to prepare for the Passover, it's the Passover celebration. And so they find a guy with a water pot on his head. Jesus said, disciples, go find this guy with a water pot on his head and he'll take you to an upper room prepared. Now, that's weird because men didn't carry water pots on their head. I mean, today it'd be like going into Cambridge or Byesville and find somebody carrying a water pot on their head, you know. In those days, women carried water pot on their head, but men didn't. So this is an unusual sign. They find this guy, he leads him to the upper room, and there in the upper room, the final night Christ spent with his disciples, he does several things. He, he fingers Judas, he points out Judas that he's the one that's going to betray him, and Judas sneaks off into the night to do his dirty deed. Jesus also changes the communion ritual, the, the Passover ritual into what we call Holy Communion, which we'll celebrate in just a few minutes. Holy Communion. This was crazy. You never change the Jewish ritual. That's how they remain um, doctrinally pure over the centuries in persecution because they kept the rituals. Jesus changed it. This is now my body. This is now my blood that will be shed. And more than that, he got down on his hands and knees and he washed the disciples' feet. He stood up and he said, you know who I am. I, I'm your Lord and I'm your master. And yet I got down on my hands and knees and I washed your dirty feet. He said, you do the same thing. He said, and if you do, blessed will you be. What's he saying? He's saying we're to help one another, minister to one another. Even if you have to get down on your hands and knees and help somebody, he's saying help one another. And if you do, in my name, you'll be blessed for that deed. Well, that night was the night that they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're praying. Peter, James, and John, his closest disciples, go off to the side and they fall asleep. Jesus is praying. He's agonizing in prayer. His sweat is great drops of blood. He comes back and he says to them, can't you guys stay awake for one hour? Here's a secret, by the way, you people that love to pray. If you'll develop your prayer life to go past an hour, I mean, I'd start with five minutes, pray for five minutes, and you know, then learn 10 and 15. You, it's hard to just jump into an hour of prayer. But if you develop yourself and go past an hour, at that one hour point, something spiritual takes place. I can't tell you what it is. I don't know, but I've sensed it many times. When you get an hour of prayer in, if you're spiritually sensitive, and you will be if you pray that much, something happens at one hour. Jesus said, couldn't you pray one hour? And they wake up, and then they hear people coming, torches lit, and they come to Christ, and Judas rushes up and, of all things, kisses him on the cheek, the Judas kiss, identifying as he's the one. Peter reacts. He pulls out a sword. He slices off Malchus, a servant of the priest's ear. Jesus, in his last healing ministry, puts the ear back on. He heals the guy's ear. They take Jesus, they, they beat him, they, there's a mock trial before Annas, the former high priest. Then they take him to the Sanhedrin, they have an illegal gathering, an illegal trial, and they lie about him, they, they, they sentence him to death, yet they can't really sentence somebody to death. 
He ends up by Friday now, they're taking him to Pilate, and, and he says, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. They send him to Herod, he doesn't find anything wrong with him. They send him back to Pilate, and then under threats of getting Caesar involved, Pilate says, have your will. Have your will. And they crucify the Lord of glory. A black man, Simon of Cyrene, helps him carry the cross to Calvary. And there between two thieves, they crucify your Lord, my Lord, Jesus, dying there. His blood was shed there. The blood that only one drop could cleanse the entire sin of all the world for all time. His blood was shed. And we were forgiven. Amen. After he was crucified, Joseph and old Nick at night, Nicodemus, the guy that snuck in at night to talk to Jesus, they went to Pilate, they got his body, they put spices on it and wrapped up in cloth like they did in those days. They put him in the tomb of Joseph, of which no one had ever laid before, and they somehow rolled this 2,000-pound stone in front of that. The next morning, though, early in the morning, women came to the tomb. You guys, have you ever noticed how women seem to lead in spiritual things? I mean, have you ever noticed that besides me? Here come the women. The guys are still asleep. The women are up there, and they, they find the announcement of an angel. He is risen. Go tell the disciples, Matthew says. And they rushed back to tell the disciples, Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? Amen? Good place for an amen? Amen. Jesus, that Saturday, where was he anyway? Where was he on Saturday? He crucified on Friday. He rose from the dead on Sunday, but where was he Saturday? You deep thinkers, let me give you a theory. This might be true. It might not be true. You decide. But have you ever considered this about Jesus Christ? It's an interesting thing. When he comes resurrection, he sees Mary Magdalene, and he says to her, don't touch me, Mary. No, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to the Father. And then he said, go tell the disciples that I've ascended to the Father. Why did he say, don't touch me? Sort of strange. If we look in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, uh, 1 Peter 3, 19, Psalm 68, they repeat what we see in the old original Apostles' Creed, that he descended into hell. There's another strange scripture, Matthew chapter 27, verse 53. It says that when Jesus Christ was crucified, the graves were open, and the saints of old rose out of the grave and went into the holy city, Jerusalem. Now think about that. There we go, okay. Uncle Fred, what are you doing here? We just buried you last week, you know, it's like... Then it says this, in, that, in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, 24, the Bible says it, it indicates that in heaven there's a temple. And Solomon's temple on earth was a replica of the heavenly temple. Could it be, could it be that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and saw Mary Magdalene? Got it? Okay, all right. Here's the conundrum. Did Jesus, during the time of his death, did he descend to hell and preach to the spirits in hell, releasing those who were from that holding tank, the saints of old, brought them to earth. He goes and sees Mary Magdalene. Don't touch me, Mary, because, you know, I'm not ascended yet to heaven. And then he goes as the first fruits leading them into heaven. The first one in there is a fully human that died and went to heaven. Could that be? And then he comes back and sees the disciples. We have some proofs of the resurrection. Number one, the change in the disciples. Do you know that almost every disciple gave their lives, in fact, including John on, as an exile, literally gave their life to preach the gospel. They were so touched by Jesus. If it were a fake, they would not have died for it, would they? We wouldn't. They wouldn't either. Also, if you take the same criteria of any 
ancient event to see if it really happened, if you use the same criteria that historians use and apply that to the resurrection of Christ, it is by far the most provable ancient fact of ancient history that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's more proofs than that. I'll stop there, I guess. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he had victory. Victory over death, over sin, over the devil. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He had victory over death. He was dead. He came back to life, a miracle. The Bible says this, Jesus standing before the tomb of Lazarus, it's uh, John 11, verse 25, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, Jesus said, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then verse 26, do we have it up there? And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in Jesus today? Do you realize that right now, if you're a born-again Christian, you possess eternal life? You'll never die. Your body will die, but you, your spirit and soul, will be given a new body in heaven, one that has hair on it, I hope, and one that will last for heavenly habitation. He, was, he won victory over death. He won victory over sin. Ephesians 1 and 7 says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many sin at least one time in your life besides me? Only three or four of you? Oh, five or six of us, okay. The rest of you guys, you might sin before the end of life, you know. A lot of us carry guilt from the sin of the past. I want you to know when Jesus rose from the dead, he took that guilt. He took that, it's as if he never, you never did it. It's as if it never happened as far as the eyes of God, the sight of God, because Jesus paid for it. If someone pays for your meal at a restaurant, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to carry the guilt of your sin because Jesus paid for it. And lastly, he won over the devil. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, he will flee. John, 1 John 4, 4, he that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Yes, there really is a Satan out there. There really are demonic uh, entities out there. And their purpose is to, as Jesus said, John 10, 10, to kill, steal, and destroy. You ever wonder how things get sort of messed up so easy in your life? You do have an adversary. But Jesus here, in the Bible here, in James says, if resist the devil... And he has to flee. Stand your ground. God has a, the right way to go. Many of us don't recognize demonic attack, but it does come for all of us. When you recognize it, stand against it. You have the victory. Gave us victory over death, hell, and the grave. Today I'm going to ask you to stand in closing here before communion. We have one song. It's called Victory in Jesus. It was a man who was really in bad straits. But in the midst of that, he considered what Christ had done for him. And he wrote this very powerful song. Will you stand this morning as we sing Victory in Jesus?